Welcome to Revere Asset Management's Your Money with Danny Stewart. The market will always overshoot to the downside and to the upside. And Don Vandenborg. Because it's not how much you make in the markets, it's how much of that you can keep. Are you watering the weeds in hopes that they'll become flowers? And is giving family members money to help out? Is that a trap or you you may have to pay their taxes? We're going to talk about that. And the election, does the election present behavioral traps for investors? Or should you just kind of stay the course and vote purple with your money so that your portfolio looks the same in November as it did in January? And speaking of following the money, the great rotation Quantified. We're going to talk about that in in detail, and, and because with big caps and small caps, with this kind of rotation out of these huge, huge mega caps, these trillion, multi-trillion dollar companies, just a five percent pullback, just five percent on a trillion dollars is fifty billion dollars. That's one company, and if that money doesn't go in the money market, it does go elsewhere. It does diversify. That's a lot of money for the small caps. It's not a lot for the big caps, but for the small caps, that's huge amounts percentage-wise, the sheer magnitude. Now, what is the reason for, for this rotation? Not that it matters. We've got a few, and again, it doesn't matter. You should follow the money, but number one, Donald J. Trump, is he the new Teddy Roosevelt, bully, bully? He's got this populist agenda. He's trying to invite everybody in, but he's also been talking about trust busting. Actually, he had uh, T.D. Vance in his speech, his VP speech, he talked about going after the big social media and the big tech companies and that they were too strong and they needed to do, do trust busting. He kind of did it at a distance from uh, the Donald, but could that be the reason? Or was it simply because big tech was oversold, I'm sorry, overbought, it was extended, and people were just taking profit, just profit taking? Or is it the diversification story that you've been hearing that everybody should be diversified and you need to go diversify away from the magnificent six or the magnificent eight or the magnificent 10? You need to diversify and do other investments. It doesn't matter what the reason is. It's happening and price equals truth. And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about, and it's a great segue from the NASDAQ and the Russell small caps. The last five, six years, there's a report out since 2018. There's big a, been a huge divergence between the NASDAQ and the Russell, their performance. And in any one year period, going back those five or six years, Either the NASDAQ clobbered the Russell or the Russell clobbered, clobbered the NASDAQ. So either way, it's, 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 it's going to be either. So what it's saying is either one does really, really well or the other one does really well, and they've been taking turns. Lately, it's all been the big tech AI stocks. Before we go to that very quickly, I want to hit that article about giving cash to family members, okay? So... If, if everybody's trying to help out in these tough times, these, you know, with this inflation and, and the economy, a lot of people, these young 20-year-olds are struggling, and the parents and grandparents have been helping out. And, and you can gift anybody you want. It's called a variety of financial lifetimes, uh, excuse me, a variety of financial lifelines, and that can be either gifts or so-called loans. And here's why you got to be careful. So you can give $18,000 away to anybody you want for any reason every year without any gift tax. In fact, you could give me $18,000 a year if you really liked me. Okay. Now, it, it, now anything over the 18,000, you have the giver must file a form 709 with the IRS, basically a gift tax return, kind of showing what you did. You don't necessarily have to pay the tax. You could start reducing your lifetime exclusion, which currently is 13.6 million for a couple. If they have it done right, it's 20, over 27 million, but that's going to be cut in half starting in January 1st, 2026. So if you're really high net worth, 
you got to do some tax planning now. But but for the people that are making loans, here's what the what they're thinking. Okay, they make a loan, and then normally they forgive the loan and 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 forgive the interest. Well. That's where it gets tricky because a loan is supposed to have interest payments detailed and you're supposed to collect those interests. Should you fail to charge and collect the adequate interest, the interest forgiven is considered a gift. And by the way, so you may do that. By the way, if you don't collect it and you don't file the gift tax and you don't do it correctly, it actually could be perceived as still being your money if it's not an executed gift. It could be perceived as your money, and therefore you're responsible to take, pay the taxes on capital gains or interest income or whatever they earn on those monies. So you've got to make sure you do it correctly, and you've got to make sure if you're going to forgive the interest, you do it correctly. I'm not talking about grats or any other type of of, of of irrevocable trust where you're giving. I'm just talking about a loan where you're giving your kids money. It's you got to do it correctly. All right. So with that, now let's get right back into the markets. I don't, we don't, I didn't have the mailbag this week. I want to start talking about the markets because the markets have changed character. They've gotten very choppy, but these asset allocation models keep telling you that that you need to diversify away from the big tech, which may be happening now, and go into small cap, but also emerging markets and everywhere else. Okay? But think about it. With all the articles of diversification, it really confirms that those places were the places you didn't want to be. Those were the weeds. Yet they're still telling you, you need to go invest in the weeds and hope they become flowers. At Revere, we do it differently. We measure what is happening while it's happening, and we make adjustments accordingly, okay? So we've been saying all along, for, and you can go back and look at all the stuff we've archived, all of our, oh, we never take anything down. We've been saying for months and even years, don't be in emerging markets, don't be in, 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 in international stuff, because American stuff is, being, is doing much better. And even up till just a month or two ago, we said don't even be in small caps here in the U.S., because it was all large cap stocks that were doing well. Just in the last couple of weeks, especially the last week, that has changed. And there's been a lot of heating up in the small caps and even mid caps and breath has, has uh, increased. And that's very important. So we've hit an inflection point and that's why I really want to get uh, straight into the markets. I, I do want to see what you guys think of the new T-shirt, though, right here. We got it right here, and it's what's in your portfolio. Can you see that, Zach? Okay, I ho hope you can see that, what's in your portfolio. And we've got Don's favorite quote. It's not what you make in the markets. It's what you can keep. Those were our two first uh, T-shirts we made. We'll have some more coming down the road. But in any event, Don, I want to go straight to you, and I want to talk about you know, you've talked. We've been talking about this over the last month, and these huge mega caps. You got Apple, Nvidia, and oh, what's the other one? Microsoft, that are multi-trillion-dollar companies. And if they pull back five percent, which some of them they've done, you're talking about fifty billion dollars for every trillion. So you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. Well, that's only five or six percent for them. But for the whole Russell small cap, the whole Russell 2000, in percentage-wise, that's huge. That's not 3%. That's not 5%. And that's why you've seen such big moves in the Russell just that past week. It just, it, it's amazing. So with that, Don, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'm going to let you do a recap of the markets and what's going on. Sure. Usually, usually we start with the S&P 500, but I think it's more important to start with the NASDAQ 100 because of those big cap weightings. So uh, some research that uh, Ted did before we started, uh, the, the Russell 2000 entire market cap is about 2.7 trillion. That is less than one of these big um, NASDAQ 100 leaders. 
So we had been talking for a while about if money came out of these massively overperforming and extended big cap tech names and went into small caps, let me bring up a chart of uh, the Russell 2000, that they could really bust to the upside. And that's what we saw last Thursday with the CPI report, uh, favorable inflation data, the market reacted as if uh, the Fed is on a path to be cutting rates for sure with inflation being somewhat controlled. And we saw a huge four day up move in the Russell 2000. That is was seen as rotation. And if you look at the O'Neill, Alex brought this up earlier this week, and uh, David Ryan did a video recently uh, on Investors Business Daily podcast. And it's really a good way to look at things, which, and that's the follow through day uh, concept that O'Neill has, but just in reverse. So when you get a big break off of the top, which we had in the NASDAQ 100 last Thursday, consider that being the opposite of a day one of a rally, consider this day one of a failure, and then look for the fourth through seventh day follow through to the downside, which is the complete inverse of uh, the O'Neill four through day, uh, four through seventh day follow through day to the upside. So instead of the, the normal follow through day to the upside confirming a rally, you can use this uh, methodology for using the fourth through seventh day to the downside to confirm a sell off. And that's exactly what you saw here in the NASDAQ 100. If that was day one, uh, day five, then, um, you saw this big break, and that was a Wednesday of this week, a break through the 21-day moving average. In the video that night, I said, what we are most concerned about right now is what happens if the NASDAQ 100 rallies into the now declining 21-day moving average and fails. And that's exactly what we saw on Thursday, rallied up to that level, failed, closed in the lower, half, a lower third of the range, and now today is following through to the downside. That was a perfect spot to take some profits or to put on a hedge. We hedged with uh, the NASDAQ 100 uh, with S triple Q on that failure into the 21 day moving average. So that's the NASDAQ 100. It's um, we, uh, the short term moving, uh, the short term trend for this is now down. This is three days below the now declining 21 day moving average. Uh, this carries a big weight for us in house here when we develop the trend gauge and the arrows for whether things are bullish, neutral, uh, or bearish. So that's the, that's the NASDAQ 100. Let's move on to the S&P 500. The S&P 500 had that same uh, day uh, of CPI where it had a negative reversal to the upside, but then the next three days it made higher highs. So that resets the day count, and that would have make, uh, made Wednesday's big break to the downside day one. And we're also getting breaks to the downside on day two and day three, and even more critical now on the S&P 500, a break of the 21-day moving average today, uh, making a lower low versus yesterday. And this is a signal to us to reduce risk if by the end of the day, this break of the 21-day moving average holds. Now, right below that 21-day is a big support level at 5,500. Uh, the low today is 5,509. Uh, so even if you do get the single close below the 21, you may find support there uh, at that 5,500 level. And we, we had a lot of focus on that uh, when for like eight, nine days, 10 days, we traded in this range before breaking out uh, two weeks ago. So that's the S&P 500. Now back to uh, the small cap index. What we're seeing is it just went too far too fast. There were a lot of people short. You can see all the volume in these four days. Uh, and Wednesday, we had a negative, I made a higher high and then a negative reversal. So that would be day one uh, to the downside. We're, we've gone lower each of the, uh, the next two days, the prior two days, Thursday and Friday. But we still haven't even hit the eight day exponential moving average on this. And uh, as long as you're above the eight day, I consider things fine. But then through the, when the fourth day comes along, if we break below that, then that would be a confirm to the downside. Uh, we should have pivot support here from this cup and handle around the 210 level. And that's also where the 21 day moving average is. So even coming into those levels, uh, if they hold, it's really not that big of a deal. And the breakout is still intact 
uh, for the IWM. So those are really the three large things that we're looking for. We, this is also coincided with uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is a more of a value type index having a nice run up, but it's come off the last two days as well. Uh, switch over to the equal weighted S&P 500. Uh, and you can see this had the four day move up very similar to what small caps were doing. And this is because the lower uh, market cap, big caps outside of the big seven, the big eight, the big 10, whatever you want to call it, uh, got had money flowing into them and that moved to the upside. But this now is a failed breakout uh, and is back into the range uh, on the equal weight S&P 500. So this would technically be a day two down off of the top, still above the 21 day moving average, but breaking the ultra short term eight day moving average today. So there's a lot of it, it's early in the game to determine if we're going to we're also entered uh, the last half of July is a seasonally weak period for the market. We're also cognizant of that. So what did we do in house? We've been detailing in the videos all night. We got stopped out of about eight different positions uh, during Wednesday and Thursday's, <clears throat> excuse me, action. And we're letting the market decide for us what's going to happen. We've got our Revere estimated balance at risk calculation, which means if everything was taken out by our stops, uh, what would the, what would our risk be to the downside? And that's less than three percent. We're about two and a half, three percent off the tops off of the top now. So uh, about a six percent pullback off of the highs before we would be effectively neutral uh, in our portfolio, or just with a small weighting in the S and P 500 while we waited for uh, a test of the 20 week, 30 week, 40 week. Remember, the market never gets into serious trouble unless you break below this black line here, the 200 day moving average. And the um, normally that's about a 12% move down from the top. And this is where all bear markets occur. Doesn't mean if you break the 200 day moving average that you're going to get the, the minus 20%, which is the definition of a bear market. But this is where the market is at its riskiest. And this is where we uh, basically take all risk off and wait for things to settle, wait for new leaders to emerge, wait for uh, the market to stop going down and then use our shorter term moving averages as signals for us to get back into the market. That's a summary, Dan. Any questions on that? Well, yeah, I got a couple, actually. I'm glad you asked. So we're really just waiting for like the great reset in, in the in the indices to try to get back in on the. So you talked about the 5500 level on the S&P. Do, and I, I want to give this to the listeners because I know that we've got a lot of IBD followers. Do you use the Jesse Livermore whole number, the 100 levels, like you do with individual stocks? Does that also apply to the indices being psychological? It absolutely does. You see it time after time that uh, those round number levels are natural pause areas for the market. Here it is just in reverse. Here's 5,500 back here uh, on June 21st. Here's a failed breakout above 5,500. Uh, on June 28th, here's us finally breaking through 5,500 in early July. And now we're coming back into testing that breakout at 5,500. We were, we were using 5,491 to be a little bit more precise, uh, but close enough, 5,490 to 5,500 is the area where we want to see the S&P 500 bounce. Are you guys also taking in consideration or counting the distribution days? I know it's still early. It's only been a couple, but, but. I think there have been five on the S&P 500. We're aware of it, but we don't. We let the individual levels take us out because there's, there's different severity of distribution days. There can be mild ones. There can be severe ones. Uh, there's also um, the possibility that the volume is being ske skewed by uh, a lot of some low uh, price stocks trading a lot of volume. So we're aware of it, but we don't strictly enforce it. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to the guys and see what they have. Let's start off with Ted, who's got uh, three charts he wants to take us through. And these are uh, some of them we introduced a little bit, but it also uh, will dive into some sectors that really improved since this uh, breakout of the Russell 2000. So take it away, Ted. <clears throat> yeah, so this is essentially just a follow-up to Connor's introduction last week. He shared these three sectors of the market. And the first one is 
IWM, just so the, the general broad small caps that Don talked about earlier in this podcast. And once we really got above the year-to-date high anchored VWAP after finding support at the year-to-date anchor VWAP, off that catalyst cooler than expected CPI, we had that gap. And that essentially led to the breakout of IWM into what we call stage two uptrend now. And I've shared what stage analysis is multiple times on the podcast before. And now we got extremely extended, which is why we took some profits to lock in some gains. Um, we saw some stats that was a four over four standard deviation move, which was the largest move of any index in, in the entire history of the markets. So that was a reasonable area to take some off. And now we're starting to pull back a bit. And today we're continuing to pull back. Although the weekly does look a bit ominous because of the long tail, we're still watching for this area against that 210 level, the base breakout retest. And that in, in, in a stage two breakout is the second area to where you can find a low risk entry point. And so this is just one area that we're keeping on watch to look to add back and add more to um, in the small caps area. And what is important is the breakout is important and the strength of it, as well as the follow through. But after that, the next kind of mental checklist you wanna have in your mind is how does it act on a pullback? Does it act as a tennis ball or an egg? And Dan has talked about this quote before, same with Don. Um, are we buying tennis balls or are we buying eggs? And we want to see how that acts on a pullback, which is happening right now. The second one, Don, which one are you pulling up? Biotech or regionals? Biotech. Okay. Yeah. So biotech, pretty kind of similar story here. Also part of the small caps, interest rate sensitive names. Since essentially they're just factories that take on a bunch of debt, looking to explore various areas in biomedicine discover drugs, therapeutics, and pharmaceuticals. And this also broke out of a very tight base that Connors talked about last week. Um, we found support at that all-time high anchor view up. And once we reclaimed that, followed by the catalyst of CPI, we blasted out on, I think that looks like six to seven days up in a row. And we're starting to pull back here. So just like the IWM, this is another area of the market that we're paying attention to, to see if we can buy on the pullback in a natural reaction. And there are some fundamental, some strong tailwinds in the fundamentals for biotech in general. Um, countrywide, I believe we've spent close to a trillion dollars in R&D in these spaces. And we're starting to see um, that money really manifest in some really world-changing drugs. For example, the weight loss drugs we've talked about many times in the past. There's a lot of gene therapies coming out, hundreds of trials um, and companies working on gene therapies that hopefully will eventually cure many of our genetic disorders and, and bring a lot more health to um, humanity. And the third one, another interest rate sensitive area of the market, as well as part of the small cap index, is KRE, the regional banks. Like the other two, we also broke above a significant anchor view up, and this is the one from all time highs. And once we surpassed that, we also blasted off um, and broke out. So just like the other ones, we want to see how this acts on a pullback to prior base highs and potentially look to take a position. All right, Ted. So, so basically, in a nutshell, we want bouncy balls. We don't want eggs, especially rotten eggs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. What's next, Don? Uh, Connor is up next. What do you got for us this week, Connor? Yep. So I have three stocks to talk about that I think are standing out to me relative strength wise. And one point that I want to cover is that, you know, the QQQs are about 5% off the highs. And I think sometimes in the market pulls back, people tend to get discouraged or maybe even lazy, but this is the time I th when it's extremely important to, to be spending extra time on your screens because when the market pulls back, relative strength um, sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh, the price action in certain stocks are gonna tell you what ones are leaders. And then when the market does turn back around, more times than not, these will be the ones that will break out first um, as the market's coming out of a correction. So I just wanna mention that. I think it's super important um, to just keep your uh, weekly watch list, 21 over 21 list, super dialed in so you can be ready when the market turns around. Um, so first name is Palantir. 
This one is one of the strongest stocks I'm seeing in the market right now. It, it's riding the eight EMA while the NASDAQ's below the 21 EMA. So you're seeing the relative strength there. And in this software industry group that's coming back to life, this is one of the best names in that. And then, you know, good numbers, up down volume ratio of 1.1. It's got a 98 composite rating. So this one, is definitely one um, I'm watching closely. It hasn't really given too many entries um, up here, but um, nevertheless acting super well. So it's on the watch list. Second name is Robinhood. Another one that I've been talking about for a couple of weeks now, but um, this one moves with Bitcoin quite a bit. It's more of a high beta name, but while the NASDAQ's corrected, this one um, has only pulled back to the 21 day. It's having a strong day today um, and it's putting a hammer off that 21 day. And uh, yeah, price has been consolidating, relative strength line has been consolidating and moving higher a little bit. So that's not breaking down either. Um, and on the weekly, this is in a stage two uptrend and that's where we want to focus because you never know how long a stock can be in stage in a stage one base. As noted, Robinhood spent um, over a year just going back and forth in that range, but now price action has established itself in an uptrend. So um, this one looks really good. And then a uh, different sector is Weatherford, um, an oil stock. Oil uh, has been pretty strong lately, and with you know money flowing out of big tech has to go somewhere. So looks like this name is getting some um, rotation. It's breaking out of a cup and handle base. It's pulled back from those highs just a bit, but handling out there nicely. And uh, this is, you know, this isn't as correlated with tech stocks or growth stocks and the relative strength line um, is, you know, like at a 45 degree angle trending up, which is good to see. Um, so yeah, these are these are three names that I'm watching, uh, and I think that are acting fine, despite the market showing a little bit of weakness the last couple of days. Good stuff. Tennis balls versus eggs. All, another way of saying it is we're looking to separate the contenders from the pretenders. Oh, there's I like always that. Wrote, yeah. There's always rotation into new names that takes place as the market pulls back. So. There are some that will uh, definitely fall by the wayside. Let the, I've been um, pointing out in the video this week that several stocks have completely broken down uh, through their 21-day moving average. Here's SMCI uh, broke down. Here's CCJ completely breaking down all the way to the 200-day moving average. Uh, software was having a, a pretty good uh, couple of weeks. Those broke the 21-day moving average. There's Datadog. Um, NVIDIA finally gave way at its 21-day moving average, but is finding support uh, at the 50-day moving average. So uh, Eli Lilly, which has been uh, just a stalwart for a while, riding that 21 day higher before just completely coming unglued uh, over the prior two days, now trying to hold on to the 50 day moving average and its counterpart Novartis NVO, or Novo Nordisk NVO breaking clear below the 50 day moving average on some heavy volume. So yeah. these stocks may not be finished in the run, but it certainly is indicating that it may be time for a base for them, but this is uh, obvious distribution. You can get caught holding on to things too long. Uh, that's why, the, you know, there are no stocks that we say are absolutely hold forever. And it's important to monitor or you you can either take the gains or the market is going to take them back from you if the, <laughs> if the wholesale selling decides to happen in some of these stocks. So that's that's the way we play it. It starts at the index level and then the sector level. Some will hold up, some aren't. Uh, but uh, it, it started with the sell-off in the, the Magnificent Seven on that big negative reversal and then followed up on day five after that with a break of the 21-day moving average. And at this point, uh, still a failure. The, the most important thing to monitor here is the continued uh, action of the 21-day moving average and what happens when uh, the price of the NASDAQ 100 meets up with that level. 
Uh, it can act as support on the way up. It can also act as resistance on the way down. We don't make any predictions as far as, well, it's got this name in it, therefore it's got to hold up or hold up better or uh, this, that, and the other. The story stops when the price disagrees with what the story is. Uh, plain and simple because the price is the only thing that dictates your bottom line. And uh, our flagship portfolio is named Grotech. And there's two parts to that. Grow on the way up, protect on the way down. And a big segment of the market has entered into protect territory. And that's the way we're playing it. All right. And, and Don, I, it just, that just perfectly dovetails with your, your, your favorite quote. It's not what you make in the market. It's what you can keep. So these, a lot of these stocks had these big gains running up and now they're starting to give them back. How much are of those gains? You're going to have to get back a little bit. So you don't just try to day trade and try, you're never going to hit the top exactly. But how much are you going to give back before you book gains? That's an important question. Leading stocks, on average, fall 72% from their top in the next bear market. So Tesla was the leading stock in 2021. It fell 69% in 2022. And then first half of 2023, it was horrible. It wasn't leading either. So it, it got clobbered. Cisco Systems, the darling of Wall Street in the 90s, had it during the tech wreck, went from almost $90 a share down to single digits, like eight, eight fifty or nine dollars a share. Think about that, folks. And, and you, you said you said in a bear it, you said it uh, falls seventy two percent in a bear market. It doesn't even have to be a bear market. Here's a former leader. Oh, it, Celsius. it could be just that stock. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that ter that topped at a hundred. And now seven weeks later, it's been cut in half. So it's got 50% of the way to the 72% uh, drawdown. Yeah. So two, yeah, well, more than two thirds of the way there. That, that's true. That's true. But it, it also goes back to our overall theme. You don't want to just pie chart, buy and hold and hope. Folks, you want enough diversification on the way up. So one stock where they're lying about the books or cheating like Enron doesn't d decimate you. But on the way down, all the correlations grow together and all goes down together, albeit at different rates. Wall Street knows that. They know that modern portfolio theory stuff doesn't work in a bear market. It doesn't protect you. So how are you going to protect your portfolio and your profits, both at the individual stock level, like Don just told you, even in a primary uptrend when it's acting right, how are you going to protect from blowups of individual stocks? And then in the bear market, how what plan do you have to go flat or very, very defensive? Like he told you, we got rebar, Revere estimated balance at risk. So we know if we have a really, really big bad day, how much if all of our stocks did get hit all at once? How much does a portfolio go down? Okay. How what plan do you have in place in advance? to protect your portfolio. Folks, you don't want to be making decisions when bullets are over going over your head and whizzing and you're in a foxhole and we're in a huge correction mode. You want to make a plan in place like you're at the beach sipping on daiquiris. You want to be relaxed and calm like now. The market's near all-time highs. It was at all-time highs a few weeks ago. Now it's not. How far it'll go back down, I don't know, but we got rules to peel Stocks, first of all, the individual stocks will be taken out organically based on their own stops, but the overall market levels will be taken off and the overall exposure, our overall risk to the markets will be taken off in le le levels as they break certain levels. So you're not just going all in and all out. Folks, you need to have a plan. If not with us, with somebody, somebody that has a sale discipline. We don't, we don't believe in that pie chart asset allocation or that rebalancing on some arbitrary date where you're, you're picking the weeds to water. I mean, you're picking the flowers to water the weeds. You just, you sell something that went down and real, I mean, that went up. You took profits on that and added the stuff that went down. Maybe the stuff that went down is still a dog and maybe it, it's junk. Maybe you don't want it. Maybe it's not bottom fishing. Maybe it's just junk. And the stuff that's leading, maybe that trend is still intact, or maybe it's going to continue to lead. 
And that's why you need rules so you don't get married to one ID, ideology or idea. And if you get an advisor that tells you this is a stock you can just stick in your drawer and hold forever or hold for life, or this is your high chart portfolio for all seasons, you can set it and forget it, run. That's our opinion because it's your money. Not Wall Street's money, not the brokerage firm's money, and they're selling products. They're selling product. They don't get paid unless they put you in their funds, their products. We don't have funds. We don't believe. I I make, we do, we get paid based on the assets in the portfolio, based on the money under management. I don't care whether you have money market, uh, bonds, stocks, gross stocks, commodities. It doesn't matter. I get paid the same way no matter what you own. In fact, I've got an incentive to get defensive if I think the market's going to go down because if I don't protect your portfolio, I get paid less. Conversely, if the probabilities are setting up and it looks like it's going to be a bullish run, I've got an incentive to get you invested. Okay? So I've got an incentive. We're on the same team. Lastly, we eat our own cooking at Revere. We actually are buying, investing in the exact same stock at the exact same time stamp and price as you do. So our money is right in there along with your money. I can't stand it when the guy on CNBC says, this is the greatest stock since sliced bread. I don't own it. My wife doesn't own it. My company doesn't own it. But you should own it. Folks, that's because they're an investment banking firm on Wall Street. And that company that he's touting is the client, okay? They're underwriting and doing some work for stocks or bonds, and he and, and they're coming out and touting that stock on CNBC to give them a warm fuzzy or they try to close a deal. Not always the case, but a lot of times it is. You're the product. You're the cattle. He's the roper delivering you the market. He's the cowboy. He's got conflicts of interest. We don't. We've got no conflicts of interest, and we invest right along with you. Folks, listen, learn a better way. Tell your friends about us. We do, we do very little marketing. It's almost all word of mouth and referrals. Just go to revereasset.com up in the right-hand corner. There's a subscribe button. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors. They just put their name and their email address in, and they can start watching our stuff and decide for themselves if they like it. Next to that is a, uh, a contact us button. You can And it, comes, it sends me an email directly, or you can just email me directly at dan at revereasset.com. You can also uh, email Don at revereasset.com or Ted or Connor at revereasset.com. You can email us a a stock you want us to review. You can get a complimentary portfolio review, get topics you want to talk about on the show. We'll do it all. And you can always, always, always call us old school at 855-REAL-WELL. Folks, we'll talk to you next week on your money, not Wall Street's money, your money. It's not about how much you make in the market. It's about how much you can keep.